Hi guys, this video is on OSPF metric types for routes redistributed into OSPF and how we can configure OSPF to dictate which path to use to reach those networks. Looking at the diagram in front, we have five routers, router 1, router 2, router 3, router 4 and router 5. Router R1 to R4 are all using OSPF and exchanging OSPF LSAs, which are links to advertisements. And for whatever reason, R1 doesn't have a OSPF relationship with R5 and has static routes to the subnets behind R5. And in this case, they are 10.1.1.0, 10.1.2.0, 10.1.3.0. .1 so these static routes that exist within the R1 routing table, when we add these routes into OSPF, we do this by using the redistribution command to redistribute these static routes into OSPF. And we do this by typing the command redistribute static or redistribute static subnet. And once these routes are in OSPF, how do we ensure the routes to the three networks take a certain path? So looking at the diagram to ensure the route takes the path from R4 to R3 and then to R1. And to ensure it doesn't take the path of from R4 to R3 to R2 to R1, the extra hop. So how do we ensure it takes one path over another path? So there are two things we need to cover off to do this which are metric and metric types. So first looking at the metric, we do this by ensuring the cost to the path we want to take has a lower cost. As this is how OSPF works, it works out which path to take based on the lowest path cost. So the lowest path cost always wins and it always takes that path. So the cost is basically the total cost of all the outgoing interfaces the traffic hops through. So in the diagram, looking at the costs highlighted in red, we can see from R1 to R3 to R1, the cost would be 10 plus 20 plus 20, which equals 50. And the other available path, which is from R4 to R3 to R2 to R1, the cost would be 10 plus 50 plus 20 plus 20, which equals 100. So here the first one wins because it has a lower cost. Now there's a few things to be aware of here. One is we don't need to manually set all of these costs up. We can do, or we can use the auto reference bandwidth command. And with this, it will work out the cost of each interface based on their speeds. And the other thing to be aware of is known as the metric type. Now, when we redistribute an external non OSPF route into OSPF, such as the static routes in this example into OSPF, so that the static routes are now inside OSPF, you're able to change what is known as the metric, which is the starting cost, which we just covered off, and the metric type. And by default, the cost, the starting cost, will be 20, by the way, if we don't specify one. So when you import these external routes into OSPF, they are imported or put into OSPF with the initial metric cost of 20 to start off with. Now, as for the metric type, which has a massive impact on how the cost is summed up, there are two metric types known as type E1 and type E2. And by default, external metrics redistributed into OSPF have a cost of 20 again. And by default, they have a metric type of E2. Now, the differences of E2 and E1 with the metric type of E2 basically means the cost never changes. So if we redistribute these static routes to these subnets into OSPF with a metric type of E2, the cost will be 20 by default, unless you specify whatever they are. And that's it. They will always have the cost assigned to them. So the cost doesn't change for metric type E2. So what this means, looking at the diagram, is although the path will take all these hops, it will always have a metric cost of 20. So whether it takes the path R4 to R3 to R1, it will have a cost of 20. Or whether it takes a path of R4 to R3 to R2 to R1, it will have a cost of 20. So they will have the same cost. And in this case, what happens with the path is it will usually perform equal cost load balancing which means it will send one connection over R3, then R1, and another connection over R3 to R2 to R1. So it will take two different paths to get to the subnets. However, as good as that sounds, uh, in the real world, we may not want this, because what if, for example, the link between R3 and R12 is a very slow link, such as a service provider link. Maybe it's an inter-DC link between the data centers, and we don't want our traffic going across the data center to the backup data center before it reaches its final destination. And this is a really common example of uh, data centers with primary and backup data centers and so on. So therefore, what we can do is use a metric type of E1. So E2 is where the cost doesn't change. 
But with E1, using this metric type, the starting cost will be 20 again, or whatever you explicitly set this as. And then it will count the cost of all the hops it takes of the outgoing interfaces, and this will provide the metric. So with E1, the cost does change. That's the big difference. And in this case, we have explicitly ensured the cost between R3 and R2 is very high of 50, as it's a very slow link. So the cost will be high, and therefore the path will not be used for the static routes injected into OSPF with the metric type of E1. So it will take the least cost path. And that's really it. That's the difference between the metric type of E1 and E2, and how you can manipulate the path within OSPF for these external routes. So for the external routes injected into OSPF, use type E2 if you don't need the cost to change as it hops through the network, or use metric type of E1 if you do want to ensure the cost is summed up to a total cost and you want the path to take the least cost route or route if you're in the US. And one more thing, you would also use the auto reference bandwidth command in a normal OSPF setup to ensure this is an automated procedure and it works out the cost for you based on the interface speeds. But you need to set this up correctly as it needs to know the maximum bandwidth supported within the infrastructure on the routers to be able to set the cost up correctly. And that's it guys, thanks for watching.